Prabhu and Bhaskar and I think the other interns will also join from there online. So welcome to this presentation and seminar by the four DCI students. Uh, first of all, let me apologize for having this seminar during the lunch time and taking away your personal time, but I'm sorry for that. We wanted to make sure that Prabhu and Bhaskar virtually join the seminar and so that's the reason why we had to schedule it during the lunch time of the Kvisat. Uh, I also would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you Etienne Bulletin. He is another PhD scholar <laughs> who has joined our program <laughs> and uh, he would be here for about 15 months. He would be coming and going yep. like on and off. And he's also working on the VDSA data and has a very interesting research topic that looks at uh, uh, family history, genealogy of families, marriage, kinship, etc. So he's a demographer by training and then he will be analyzing the VDSA data from a demographer's perspective. So that's also so uh, you, are, you would be receiving more invitations even he would be giving more seminars, I think, as he progresses in his work. And so I think that's an interesting topic for us to attend and listen to him. So let's come back to the DCI seminar. Uh, and like starting 2014, we've been having interns from the Tata Cornell Agriculture for Nutrition Initiative every summer. And this summer also, we had four interns with us. And they are Eileen, Cairo, Rachel, and Jamal. And this is the first time we had all girls group. Usually there is one boy to balance, I think. So. But this time it was all girls. And they have been here from, for more than six weeks as of now. And they have had like two weeks in the office, two weeks in the village. And then when they came back after data collection, then it was an intense period of like, understanding the data, analyzing it, report writing and preparing for the presentation. The topic that we have chosen for their internship, it was mutually arranged, uh, agreed upon by DCI and Equisat, is looking at the intra-household allocation of food and the nutritional dynamics of it, with a focus on the adolescents. And since they had just two weeks of time in the village and it is difficult to collect data on such an uh, uh, intense data on this topic, we decided to go in as a case study and so we collected this data only from two villages in Maharashtra. Now why do you think intra-household allocation of food understanding this is important? Can anybody say? Because okay. it's unequally distributed. Yeah, right. So let's see. <laughs> what they have to say, whether it's unequally distributed or whether there's equity or well studying the household is enough and then there's no need to study the household allocation. So let's hear what they have to say based on their experiences from the field. So I request the four of them to plan in such a way that you complete your presentation in 20 to 25 minutes and then or maybe that's some <laughs> And then we really open the floor for some Q&A and first of all we'd invite Bhaskar and Prabhu to ask any questions they have and then others can also ask the questions. And then the concluding part is the certificate presentation by the HR team and okay. us. Okay, so over to you now. Alright, thank you Panmaja. So my name is Jane Abigail and I'm a graduate student in Applied Economics. And I'm Rachel, I'm studying biology. My name is Cairo, and I'm studying nutrition and plant science. I'm Irene, I'm studying global and public health sciences. All right, so as uh, Anajan mentioned earlier, um, the goal of the study was to really look at inter-household food allocation. Um, so the role that it plays uh, together with uh, government programs related to nutrition and food security and nutritional dynamics in impacting and or in determining the nutritional status of adolescents in, in the semi-arid tropics in India. So we had three main objectives that are listed here. The first one was uh, really trying to determine whether the, the quality of the diet of adolescents were compared to that of their household. Uh, the second one looked at the role that inter-household food allocation plays in uh, determining the nutrient intake for these adolescents. And the third one pertaining to government programs evaluated three different government programs and to really see whether they were uh, impact, 
they had an impact on the nutritional status of, of um, the, the target population. So for this last part, I did a separate study, and so I'll be talking more in, de in more details later about that one. Okay, so just an overview of intra-household food allocation. Um, so today there's this growing phenomenon in developing countries, like rapidly developing countries such as India and in middle income countries, where you have a dual burden of malnutrition. Meaning that in the same villages and in the same households you have people who are undernourished and people who are overnourished. Um, and the problem is that this hasn't really been studied much in the past. Papers on allocation mostly focus on expenditure of the family and then how that, how that reflects allocation. So how much does the family spend on health care? How much do they spend on agriculture and education? But they don't usually look at how food is actually divided among the members. And in the cases where they do look at food allocation, they mostly look at calories. So they don't look at the allocation of individual nutrients and they don't look at quantity. So how deficient or sufficient is each individual member. Um, so these are the three main models of food allocation, the three explanations for it. So we have the functional model, which basically means that the most productive family members are going to get allocated the most food, because that's going to give the most reward to the family in the long term. And then we also have the resource control model, which is basically says that power dynamics between the head male and the head female influence allocation. So the head male and the head female have a certain power structure, and then that determines who can determine where food is allocated and to which members. And then finally we have the cultural model which says that food is allocated to the family members who are most respected per the culture of that community. So if elders or men are most respected then they're going to get allocated the most food. And then this is a diagram from our supervisor in the U.S., Prabhu Pingali, and it um, does a good job of summarizing the determinants of nutritional status. So, you have the broad determinants, like household access to diverse foods. So are nutritious foods available in the market in the first place? Can families buy them? And then household income. So do they have enough money to purchase a diverse array of nutrients from the market? Um, and then individual factors. So positive nutrition behavior includes what we're studying into household food allocation. So even if the household has the food, are positive behaviors being used to make sure everybody is nourished? And then finally, nutrient absorption is the one determinant that we couldn't really study because we didn't look at biomarkers. Um, but we looked at all of these other three to see what is actually determining nutritional status. So the target population of our study was adolescents, so individuals aged 10 through 19. Adolescence is an important period to study because it is a rapid period of growth and development. A majority of height and weight is gained during this period, and malnutrition can have long-term health consequences. Also, individuals during this time period are easily influenced by external factors, such as um, their peers or the media. So lifetime eating habits are developed during this period. We also wanted to see the differences between male and females, because differences in nutritional requirements begin to emerge. Females are generally deficient in calcium and iron, and this is of particular consequence as they become future mothers. Um, males, adolescent males are, um, are an understudied group because a lot of the nutrition programs focus on females, but they're also an important group to study as they begin to enter the workforce. Okay, so I don't know that we need to answer the question why India for this group, but um, one half of the cases of micronutrient deficiency are located in India, so micronutrient deficiencies are very big here. Um, and then within India, 40% of Maharashtra falls within a drought-prone region. So that means that every, about every five years there's a drought in Maharashtra. And the 2012 drought, which wasn't even really the worst one in recent years, caused decreases in grain and vegetable production by 18 and 11%. So you can see here how climate is impacting agriculture and that's impacting food security and in turn nutrition in this region. So we used uh, five different methods to assess this dynamic question of intra-household food allocation. And um, I will be talking about all of these methods in detail, but just to give an overview. Uh, the first two methods that we used, the MMDA and the Gibson's 24-hour, are both dietary survey methods. And then the last three, the anthropometric measurements, uh, focus group discussions, and market level of diversity, are meant to get at some of the more um, less direct questions that we had. Uh, such as BMI, uh, cultural understandings of food practices, 
and um, what sort of economic access these households had to different food groups. So our sample population consisted of 58 VDSA households. Uh, 37 of these households were in Sherpur and 21 of these households were in Komen. And um, in these households, we surveyed 80 adolescents total. So we decided to take a subsample of 51 of these 80 adolescents to conduct our 24-hour dietary recall. And all 80 adolescents participated in our, in our MNDA survey. And we completed 81 anthropometric measurements. Um, there's like 81 is because we actually had an extra adolescent that wasn't included in our sample. So this is an example of the MNDA format. So MNDA stands for the Minimum Nutrition Data Set for Agriculture. And it was actually designed by TCI interns in 2014 to help understand the nutritional dynamics of a lot of rural farming communities in India. And essentially what it is, it's a three-day recall that is count-based, so you're able to calculate a dietary diversity score, which will be discussed later, um, from all of this information. And what's great about this survey method is it includes a market day as well, because a lot of literature has cited that food consumption is very different on market day than on normal days, and we decided to compare those two factors to see if it impacted dietary diversity. Uh, the next method was a 24-hour recall method, and this is extensively written about in Gibson and Ferguson's 2008 manual. And it's a weight-based method that allows us to calculate the macro and micronutrients consumed by all of our respondents. And it's nice because it's a pretty easy method for researchers to use. It's less invasive and it's much faster than a lot of other recall methods. And we used a variety of different measurement tools to get the portion sizes of the food. So this is just a nice image of all the tools that we used. Um, in Gibson's method, all measurement tools are proxy measurements. Uh, we don't weigh direct foods unless they're readily available to us in the home. And um, this is actually Rachel doing a 24-hour recall. And the third method we use is a simple anthropometric method where we took height and weight to calculate their BMI. And the fourth is a focus group discussion to get some insights on the cultural implications of eating within these villages, as well as getting an understanding of what these kids know about um, health, nutrition, wellness, and inter-household food allocation. And the final method is a market level assessment. So we actually calculated a score of diversity for the market um, by tallying all of the different foods that were sold in the market. And uh, the term that I've been using, dietary diversity score, will now be explained by everyone. All right, so the ingredients of all the dishes recorded on the MNDA were categorized into the 16 food groups as defined by the FAO. So then using those food groups, we were able to calculate the individual dietary diversity score. And this is calculated out of 14 food group categories. And the household dietary diversity score is calculated out of 12 food group categories and market level dietary diversity is all the food groups available in the market and that, that was calculated the same way household level dietary diversity was calculated. And the reason we're looking at three different um, scores is because we wanted to see if individual scores were a result of allocation within the household or if the households themselves didn't have access to certain food groups in the market. So initially we ran we wanted to see if there was differences in diversity between market and normal days. So we ran a t-test for both adolescents and households and found that there was a difference, meaning that on market days they were eating more diverse diets than on normal days. And then we calculated IDDS and HDGS percentages out of the total number of food groups and also ran a t-test and found that there was a difference, uh, meaning that the adolescent was eating less diverse diets than their whole household pot. We also looked at um, differences within age groups, caste group categories, and land sizes, and found that between those groups, there was no significant differences. So this bar chart shows all of the food groups that adolescents, no, the total number of food groups each adolescent, all the adolescents consumed. And as you can see, the cereals had the, the most amount of adolescents consuming. And sweets, spices, condiments, and beverages, although there was high consumption, uh, those were not used in the calculation of IDDS. Also, it's important to note that milk and milk products, although there's a high consumption, um, most of their, uh, most, they were mostly getting this food group from their teas, so it was in very small quantities. Uh, when looking at market level dietary diversity survey uh, scores, 
Uh, we did um, a tally of all the foods in the market. Um, both the Shirpur and Kalmar markets had a score of 9 out of the 12 possible food food categories. <laughs> okay, so as I read mentioned, um, our main findings from the Dietary Diversity Surveys was that the adolescent diet was significantly less diverse than the entire household pot. So the household is eating, has access to a more diverse um, more diverse food groups than the adolescents actually consuming. And this was consistent among gender, age, and caste groups. There weren't any changes. Um, but also, both adolescents and the households as a whole were consuming significantly more diverse diets on market day. So on market day, their households were households and adolescents were able to meet or rise above the dietary diversity score of the market, meaning that they had as many food groups that the market had plus more. Whereas on normal days they were eating less food groups than the market contained. So this kind of shows, can't exactly show, but it shows a correlation between the market day and the dietary diversity, meaning that they're dependent on the market for a lot of their, for some of their food groups. And then we also show that there was limited access to certain food groups in the market, meat, milk products, and eggs. And that's why Irene said they only got scores of 9 out of 12 because they were missing these food groups. And that means that they weren't available in the market. They were available in other sources in the village from their own farm or from a shop. Um, however, this could be the cause of why they were deficient in certain nutrients. So the results from my read test showed the dietary diversity, and we compared the market to the adolescent and the household. Um, but we also wanted to look at if there are specific nutrients that the adolescents are not getting, and if there's bias in allocation with respect to specific nutrients. So we did this in two different ways. Um, we looked at deficiency and sufficiency with respect to the RDA. So we looked at, is the adolescent getting their recommended dietary allowance of each nutrient? And then in order to look at allocation, we also wanted to see, is the household getting their RDA? Are they meeting their RDA? Unfortunately, there's not an RDA for households. We had to calculate that. So we had to add the RDAs of each individual family member to get the total household. So theoretically, if the household is meeting his, their RDA, that means that they have enough of that nutrient for everybody in the household to be sufficient. So that was our first method, and then this was the second one. Um, just to compound that first one, we looked at if adolescents were actually receiving their appropriate portion of the household pot. So even if the household was undernourished as a whole, are they getting what they should be getting, or are they suffering disproportionately to other family members? And this was a little more complicated to calculate, um, but what we had to do is we use this formula down here. Might be a little hard to see, but appropriate portion of household pot we took the actual household intake. So what was the actual intake in the pot, in the household pot, in milligrams or grams of each nutrient? And then we divided that by the total number of consumption units in the family. And consumption unit is kind of like a person in the family, but it accounts for their gender and their age and their lifestyle. So for example, instead of an uh, active adult man being one person, he actually counts for 1.2 people because his requirements are more. And a sedentary woman only counts for 0.8 people because her requirements are less. And then after we divided those two, we, times, we multiply by the individual consumption unit. So what was that? What was the adolescent's actual consumption unit? And in most cases, the adolescent's consumption unit is one. So we, I remote explain how to use these two methods. Uh, so this chart shows the mean percent deviation from RDA, which is the first method that Rachel spoke about. So here, if the value is negative, that means there were that percent under their RDA, and if the value was positive, there were that percent over. Um, so we ran the t-test between males and females by each of the um, nutrients, and found that there was only significant differences for six of the nutrients, which meant for proteins, fats, carbs, zinc, phosphorus, and niacin, there was a difference in the mean deviation from RDA. Um, next, we looked at the percent deviation from the appropriate allocation, which is the second method that Rachel spoke about. And again, the same, if they're in the negatives, that means they were that percent under the allocation, and in the positives, they were that percent over. So as you can see, for males, the only nutrient they were falling under them was folic fol acid. For, for females, they were only over in fat, calcium, and vitamin C in terms of allocation. So when we ran a t-test between males and females, we found that there were statistical differences between all the nutrients in terms of allocation, except for folic acid. Okay, so this chart just tries to summarize the last two charts that Irene put off. 
Um, it kind of combines the two factors we looked at, whether or not they were meeting their RDA and if they got their appropriate portion. So in these four columns, it says over and under. Sorry if it's a little hard to see back there, but under just means they were under their RDA and over means that they were over. Um, and then this says allocation bias against females, so that means that females weren't getting their appropriate portion of the household pot. And same thing with males. So as you can see here, females are not getting their appropriate portion in almost every nutrient. Males are only being biased against in folic acid. So I already mentioned that that one was particularly interesting because the household is over its RDA in folic acid. So theoretically, the household has enough folic acid for every member to meet their RDA. However, both females and males are under their RDA, and they're also being biased against. They're not receiving their appropriate portion. So we can kind of conclude here that because they're being biased against, they're falling under their RDA, even though they don't have to. The, the nutrients are there. And then uh, if you look at the energy, it's also an interesting case because the household is under, but both the male and female are over, or slightly over their requirement. So this suggests that they're probably getting energy from outside the house because we only looked at the household pot, but when we calculated their RDA, we included snacks and everything they bought outside. So females are being biased against, but because they're going outside the house, they're still meeting their requirement. Um, and then in two of the really important nutrients we looked at were protein and B12. These were also important in terms of gender differences because for protein and B12, females are being biased against and the household is under. However, males are actually over. So even though the household is deficient, the males are not suffering at all. They're actually meeting their RDA. And the females are under, and they're being disproportionately, they're suffering disproportionately because they're not getting their portion. And then the, the ones that say under for household, and then also male and female, so that's iron, carotene, riboflavin, and zinc. Um, both adolescents were under, as was the household, which is unfortunate in itself. But also, females are being biased against. So they're even more under their appropriate portion and suffering disproportionately because the house is deficient. And then you can see some of them, all the adolescents are over. And those are of less consequence if there's bias because they're still meeting their RDA. However, it'll be a problem in the lean seasons if the households are not getting enough nutrients and the girls are still being biased. <coughs> yeah, so this just summarizes all that. Okay, yeah, so to complement the, 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 the analysis that was, just, um, that was just presented, we also run a couple of regressions. And the question we really want to understand what, what were the determinants of inter-household food allocation. And so two different regressions uh, were, were estimated here. Yeah. So the first one uh, uses the relative nutrient adequacy ratio as the measure of inter-household food allocation. And this one was calculated using so it was the, the relative share of the household part that the adolescent was getting. So it was u calculated by um, taking the actual intake of the adolescent over their RDA, divided all of that over by the actual household intake divided by the RDA of the household. Um, and the second regression here, we measure into household food allocation by the deviation of the adolescent away from their um, appropriate portion. So those were the two regressions that we used. And, and I'm going to be showing you um, some of the results very soon. Um, so we included four different types of variables. When you look at the first, the first um, regression, ADO stands for adolescent, and it includes the age and gender of the adolescent. Household includes information on the household head, so age of the household head, um, the education level, but also their main occupation. Decision is a decision-making uh, variable, which tries to capture the, the effect of female empowerment um, on inter-household food allocation. Productive gets at the, the income level of the household. And here, because most of our sample was uh, involved in agriculture, we use crop area and crop diversification as a measure of uh, productivity within the household. For the second equation, um, we added two different variables. Um, ADO under and HH under. These two, they were one if the household or the adolescent were, un were undernourished, and they were, it was zero otherwise. Okay, so just a quick, quick note here. Um, if we focus on the red box, we see that the first column shows you the energy, um, the, the relative nutrition allocation for energy. And so that's basically, it's over one if the adolescent is consuming 
more than the household average. It's less than one if they're consuming less than the household average. The energy deviation is measures the deviation away from the appropriate portion. So the, more, the, the greater the deviation is, uh, the greater the bias is. So we see that there's a clear gender bias here. Um, and it goes from 19% in the case of energy intakes to about 30% for protein. One, so gender was found to be very significant um, that it affects the intra-house, how food is allocated within the household. One other variable that was very interesting was the occupation of the male head. And here the variable that's not um, listed is, the, is when the head works on his own farm. So when the father in the household works on his own farm, they would be less biased within the household. And so these variables indicate the level of that bias compared to when he worked, he had a business or when he worked on domestic work or when he had, uh, he had a paid job. But when we look at the same variable for the female head, dramatically the, the results switch. So now, for the female head working on her own farm at home, um, it led, it, it led to, to more bias compared to when she had a business or when she did domestic work, for example. Then we, I also looked at um, caste, so trying to understand how whether belonging to different castes had an impact on how food was allocated within a household. Here, the results were not very conclusive. Um, so the, the, this should say OBC, which is the other backward caste. When compared to the forward caste, um, the bias was, they, they had more bias. And this is the, these are some of the, the, the coefficients that kind of give you those results. But when, we, when you're looking at, for example, um, the last column over there, the results switch signs. So it's, it wasn't very conclusive. Um, and we, I mean, we included it just to see what it was, but it didn't seem to have, we don't have much evidence to, to believe that caste was a, a big um, factor in determining intercultural food allocation based on, on our data. Yeah, so to just recap it real quick, we found a positive relation between gender, adolescent undernourishment, and the female head working within the household. So this factor increased the bias against adolescents. And there was a negative bias, um, so a decrease in the bias when the male head worked on the family farm compared to working outside and when the household was undernourished, which was an interesting finding. And some other results were less conclusive. So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, there was another study that was kind of um, conducted on the side that looked at policies and programs. And we're trying to understand who are the, po the, the, the programs and policies targeting at adolescents, are they effective? Are they getting at their target population? And do they have an impact on their nutritional status? So three different programs were evaluated. The PDS, which is a public distribution system, um, the ICDS, and which is um, the integrated uh, child development scheme, and the, uh, the midday meal program. So I'll talk about each of these separately. So for the PDS, in the villages we went to, there were two PDS dealers um, where they provide rice, wheat, sugar, and kerosene at a lower price, depending on the poverty bracket that the family falls under. Um, and there was an overwhelming sense that since its inception, there was a lot of, um, the, the level of food security had really uh, increased in, in these villages. Um, and there was also a lot of change in the cropping patterns, because by Focusing, because the program provides rice and wheat, you had um, a lot of the, um, when the staple food used to be sorghum, for example. Sorghum roti used to be the staple food maybe 20 years back. Today it's become the wheat roti. Wheat roti is more often consumed because of the, how cheap it became under the PDS. And there was also some um, challenges in terms of delays in payments of the workers, delays in delivery, um, and leakages that, that, were, that weren't accounted for. Yeah, the second program was the ICDS, and this is, and it has a sub-program called the Kishori Balika, which is a, a girl scheme, and it gathers together girls, between others and girls, between the ages of um, 11 and 18, to teach them more about it, nutrition and health. So it's a, um, it's a health and nutrition education program. There were about 67 girls that were involved in the program, that took part in the program uh, when we interviewed uh, in Kauma and Shirabu. But the impact that it was having on their behavior was quite ambiguous. Um, the, the teachers that were interviewed didn't feel like it was having much impact. Um, and, 
and later I'll be offering some recommendations as to ways to change that. And the last one is the midday meal program, uh, where in, in the government schools, students would get um, a, a, a hot meal every day uh, during lunchtime. And it really it led to a huge increase in enrollment and attendance in the schools, and especially for girls. So for some reason, in both, in both Kalma and Sherpa, the evidence was that um, the, in, yeah, the increase in enrollment and attendance was really um, uh, significant. But yet again, the same problems. There were delays in payments, in delivery of the grains. There were problems with uh, the, the kitchen sheds and things like that. Uh, a lot of the kids also complain about the, the menu not being diverse enough. And so it, it's been a little hard kind of seeing what the, the impact of, of this was because our entire, most, of, most of the kids in our sample were getting the material. Yeah, so here are just a couple of recommendations. I'll, I'll just leave it up here and talk about some of the important ones. Uh, but I think in general, it, from what I got, it was really important to increase collaboration between the government and private organizations. Uh, there have been a lot of anecdotes where when um, an NGO, for example, took charge of the midday meal preparation, the meals were better, they were more diverse, uh, and the kids liked it more. Um, and for the Kishwadi Balik, I think it would be important to, to have an education system where that is more interactive, where the girls are being told what nutritious mean, and they actually believe in it, and they would um, take actions necessary to, to make sure they're eating nutritious food. And just some recommendations for the community. I, it felt to me that there was a need for more cooperation between the different schemes that were in the village, um, and an opportunity also for different community members to provide feedback to the government. Um, so just to conclude, um, I know we've given a lot of information to you, but for some of the main takeaways, uh, we found a clear allocation bias um, in folic acid, regardless of the gender of the adolescents. And we also found a bias in protein, iron, and B12, which are all very important nutrients. Um, that was gender driven. So women were typically receiving less than their adolescent male counterparts. And to summarize some of the regression um, results, uh, we determined that the two main factors that are influencing household allocation are not only the gender of the adolescents, but the gender of the household heads, and also the occupation of the household head. So although our study, we had a great time doing it, we had some limitations, as all studies do. Um, the main one, well, one of the main ones is that we didn't look at iodine in um, our nutritional analysis. And this is important because iodine is one of the four main deficiencies common in India. So in future research, this nutrient should definitely be uh, observed. And the second one was our sample size. So we did have a fairly small sample size, partially due to our small duration in the field but also due to the lack of availability of households while we're in the villages. And um, because we conducted two survey methods at the same time, uh, there was a lot of respondent fatigue that we encountered when we were interviewing participants. And that could have resulted in differences in the data that they provided us. And um, we also included food that was consumed outside of the home as a house in the household pot for our surveys which is not included as um, something you should be doing based on FAO guidelines and the Gibson's methodology. But um, because uh, food households are moving towards eating more packaged food, we thought it was OK to include. And I think for the purposes of our study, it's not as big of a deal. And we also used a proxy for the household pot. So we spoke to the woman responsible for cooking as a proxy. And in the same way that food, um, packaged food may not be great, if you wanted to know the individual consumption of every member of the household, you should definitely do an individual um, analysis. But because we only wanted to see access of adolescents in the household, the proxy was okay. And for some future research, we'd like to definitely look at the seasonality of inter-household food allocation. Because as Rachel talked about before, in Karif season, there is an abundance of crops and abundance of food. So um, the allocation might be different in lean seasons. And a lot of literature has indicated that in lean seasons, uh, women might be allocated less food. Or there's also studies that have said that women will be allocated more. So it'd be good to study this. 
And we'd also like to see um, the role of eating behaviors outside of the home, because like I said, um, packaged food has become more and more prevalent in these villages. So it'd be good to include that in some uh, future surveys. And we'd like to take some longitudinal um, data collection on BMI and see if there's any a causal relationship between BMI and intra-household food allocation. And we'd also like to look at um, a comparison between the dietary deficiencies and clinical deficiencies using biomarkers. Um, so this concludes our presentation and soon we'll have Q&A, but we'd like to thank a lot of people. Um, the first being the TCI team, specifically Prabhu and Jessica, for making this whole internship possible for us. And we'd also like to thank, thank the huge team at Ikersat. Everyone has been so supportive, especially Padmaja and Kavita. Um, Padmaja, you've been a great lead scientist in our project. And Kavita um, has taught us kind of everything we needed to know about data collection. And Swati, Duche, and Babu, you guys were invaluable in the field and throughout our work here. And um, we'd also like to thank all of our enumerators for being able to translate and work with us. And we built pretty great friendships with all of them. Yeah, and Sumitra for doing all a lot of the data, and Suda for helping with data entry and. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. um, I guess we can open the questions. Hello? Prabhu? <laughs> Can you hear me? How yeah? <laughs> so, thank you, the four of you, Kairu, Zainab, Eileen, and Rachel. Uh, now I would like to open the floor for question and answers, but first I'll give the chance to Prabhu and Bhaskar who are in Delhi. Uh, along with other interns. Uh, they joined in a bit late, but maybe they have some questions or they will need some clarifications. So Prabhu and Bhaskar, I request that you type in your questions and we will read it out to them because this does not allow for a microphone access from a remote location. So in the meantime, while Prabhu is typing, if anybody has any questions, they can start asking. Yeah, yeah. Question, were all of the adults women in the sample in their parental household or were some of them married in their husband's household? Every single one of them was still in the household, right? Yeah, maybe one of them. There were some that were married, but they were still living in their parents' Okay. Yeah, that was a big problem for us because a lot of the girls are married out and they're married into other villages. So that's part of the reason why the sample yeah. was so small. <laughs> so they actually the sample when we took the master list from here, we saw that there were more number of adolescents there. But when we actually went to the field, they found that many of the girls were married out and therefore yeah. like the sample size became small. So did you make any recommendations to increase the micronutrients or can you make any recommendations to increase the micronutrients uptake in terms of what in each and things? <laughs> I think that based on our findings on allocation, the nutrients need to be given directly to the adolescent girls because if we give them to the household, they're still not going to get the appropriate portion. And with something like PDF, the rice and the wheat, we ask households how they use it, and it's always for the whole household pot, and then it gets divided. So if we want it to go specifically to girls, they need to be given it outside the house, like in school, or maybe through some of the programs Gina have talked about, and she can. Yeah. yeah, so one of the problems with this supplementation is that um, the ICDS has, has a supplementation um, initiative. But what happens a lot of the times is that the girls do not don't consume the, the supplements. And I think, um, so what they've been trying to do was, uh, in one case, to be giving them yearly supplements. Yeah. But then those, of course, come with a lot of different cons consequences on their health. Uh, because for them to be taking them at a regular interval, it was, it was quite hard. And, I remember asking a lot of uh, some girls during the focus group discussion whether you take supplements. I was like, no. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I remember talking to a lady in my lab a long time ago. Her father used to be a doctor in Texas in the 40s and the 50s, and a lot of the Hispanic immigrants had nutritional deficiencies. And one way her, her um, father did is get the total cereal, because it's fortified with all vitamins and minerals, and have it at school. 
So it's one meal that has all the vitamins and minerals and that has mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a big problem with the supplements because when you take yeah. them on their own on their own individually, there are a lot of side effects. Yeah. And we yeah. didn't even like that wasn't included in our calculations. So mm -hmm. some of them could have been taking supplements, but cleaner as a result Maybe fortified foods at the school. Yeah. 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 And and that's the that's the hope with the midday meal. But I think there's still a lot of work to be done to actually make it a nutritious meal. Um, because at this point, a lot of the, it's always the same food. It's a lot of cereal and pulses. Mm -hmm. No, a, a lot of the times it doesn't include any vegetables, uh, and it's not very diverse. And I think that's something that that would be important for um, people that are leading the program to think about. Another uh, thing, another thing is also you need to bring about a behavior change because if you see from their data and even the data that we've collected. Consumption of vegetables, consumption of foods, consumption of locally available vegetables. It's very limited, like, and that's where I think a lot of. So if like they consume the locally available vegetables and green leafy vegetables and fruits, then I think the micronutrient content in the diet will also improve, and so that could be. So we have to bring about a change in behavior, like. Not just focus on the staples, but also add more variety to their diet. It's interesting. I, we are, Ben and I are so. We are so scientists. We're not food. I mean, I don't deal with plants. But one of the micronutrient deficiencies in the soil that everybody has been finding is zinc. So they've been recommending applying a lot of zinc, and I think that's part of it. So you may eat the foods, but it may not have all the nutrients because it's deficient yeah. in the soil. Yes. So that's uh, soil nutrition also becomes yeah. very important. So you also need to understand like what's, how good the soils are or what is the deficiencies in the soil. And then maybe if you can go parallelly work on that, then I think the foods also would be having the nutrients that they should be having. Does Prabhu have any question? Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and also we will send them the copy of the presentation and the report and they can still ask their questions to us. Yeah. Yeah. So we can do I have another question for you. I'm sorry. So it was interesting to to hear you say they don't eat a lot of vegetables. Why is that? Is it because it's it's considered not healthy or not safe or why is that? Uh, just curious. Yeah, so they, many of them still understand that eating vegetables is healthy. So it's not that they don't think it's not safe. But there are certain myths uh, that add to it though, like, you know, you should not be eating this vegetable in this part of the year or this time of the year or don't eat a vegetable in combination with a cereal. So that so they have some of these myths. Like for example, a pregnant woman, a lady who is becoming pregnant for the first time, she's not allowed to eat bananas. Whereas bananas are a very rich source of micronutrients. And so they have their own reasons or the myths that follow. So you need to break some of those myths. The second thing is like though we saw that on the market day the diversity in the diets is high like compared to the other days. So they do not have like uh, problems or like they also have problems of where do they keep their vegetables. Like these are perishable so they don't get them on a uh, large quantities. Yeah, but they may get them on smaller quantities and they may not buy all the vegetables that are available also. That's why. And the third one which we have not addressed also is to look at sanitation aspects. So it could be that they might be eating the vegetables in a quantity that is enough, but then because of, you know, the not hygienic practices, like especially drinking water and then the way the water is treated as well as access to sanitation uh, facilities, maybe it is hindering the absorption of the nutrients. Uh, into their system. So that also could be. So we need to understand and look at that also. Yeah, and additionally, we looked at, um, we looked at um, the cooking state when they consumed it. So raw vegetables yeah. are very rarely consumed. They're consumed in like a small salad with dinner, maybe onion and lemon. But all the other vegetables that are high in micronutrients, the green leafy vegetables, are all cooked for a long time and then consumed. So a lot of the micronutrients are lost. Any other questions? Yeah.
So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and it was interesting and also informative. Yeah. So thank you, Cairo, Jaina, Vaivin and Rachel. So they did really had to face hard times when they were in the village and also when they came here. And then they had to adjust the two different climatic situations. The food, everything was so different, but uh, they managed it. Yeah, they managed it. So congratulations. And we have now Richa, who is the coordinator of the learning systems unit. And I think they have... They deserve the certificate. They won the certificate <laughs> now. So maybe we just present the certificates to them. <laughs> All yours for me. Who is an So you can call and rescue. So, Rachel, maybe here. We should stand here. Okay. Come. <laughs> presentation and hope you enjoyed it and we will have more of these presentations so we look forward to seeing you more often. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.